I, uh, I find myself standing at the entrance of the, uh, the West Kennet Long Barrow um, here in Wiltshire. And um, it was a burial, a uh, series of burial chambers um, extending about a hundred yards uh, in, in length. Uh, a, a long barrow constructed um, about five and a half thousand years ago in which the, uh, the bodies of at least three dozen men, women and children were buried. Um, over a, a relatively short period of time, the, uh, the site was uh, visited for um, several hundred years after that and numerous artifacts were discovered here along with a good number of bones, um, suggesting that it was uh, considered to be a very important place over a, a lengthy period of time. Not far from here is the sanctuary, um, then a little bit further um, up the road um, beyond Silbury Hill, um, a huge uh, um, man-made uh, earth mound uh, built a, a, a little later than this time. Um, but a, a little further along the road is uh, Avebury Circle, um, a splendid ancient uh, stone circle. And then um, a little further away in the other direction is uh, the better known Stonehenge. And um, all this got me to thinking about all sorts of different things about life, about death, about uh, the changes that uh, that we've seen uh, throughout the millennia. I'm going to take a, a little look inside and um, well, see what we might be able to see. Hmm, I'm, uh, I'm actually standing inside one of the burial chambers in which uh, the uh, the remains of several bodies were found, um, having laid undisturbed for um, well for well over five thousand years. Um, of course, they've been removed and you know, taken away a, a, a long time ago now. Um, but it's remarkable to think that this place has had such a um, such a, a, a long history and that it remains um, relatively intact uh, even to this day. And it's um, it's open to the uh, the elements, and uh, one just walks up the hill and, uh, and has a little look inside like this. But um, so uh, it's getting a bit nippy, actually. So I think I'm going to, uh, going to head inside and uh, finish off. It's, uh, it's quite sunny outside, but it's, uh, yeah, it's quite late in the evening. The sun's about to set. So um, pop inside and we'll uh, pick up from there, shall we? Yes, it's uh, certainly a lot warmer inside and uh, a bit brighter too. But what a fascinating place the Long Barrow is. And it's, it's extremely difficult to imagine what a, a hive of activity it must have been long before the likes of Abraham walked the earth in lands far from these. But these were our ancestors, at least in general terms. These were among the many thousands who once populated these islands, leaving behind a legacy at which we can but wonder. Indeed, the land is riddled with ancient monuments such as these, all bearing witness to lives that lived long, long ago and bearing witness to death. It simply isn't possible to know just what prehistoric peoples within these shores believed when it, when it came to matters of life and death and life after death. Being, as we say, prehistoric, there are no written records, and all we have to go by are evidence from the monuments and, and artefacts that have survived. But in light of the trouble taken to build these lasting monuments, such as the, the West Kennet Long Barrow, and to deposit various grave goods alongside the, the human remains, 
It seems most reasonable to believe that they clearly did have some understanding that this life wasn't necessarily all that there was. And this is typical of ancient societies throughout the world, even if there were as many different beliefs as there were people. There was a distinct awareness that there was something beyond all we can see with our human eyes. Of course, as I wandered through the burial chambers of the Long Barrow, all evidence of ancient life long removed, there was no indication of any other beings within the vicinity. Well, apart from a couple of young chaps who, like me, were just passing by. I suppose we might think, if only these stones could speak, and I'm sure that if they could, well, they would have many a tale to tell. Maybe you visited similar places yourself, but what of those who once lived and laboured and expired all those centuries before? I remember a number of years ago lying where a corpse would once have lain within an Iron Age tomb at Beth Shemesh, some 17 miles southwest of Jerusalem. So far removed in time from what must have been scenes of great sadness, but with absolutely no idea whose place I was temporarily occupying. But here is a remarkable truth. An hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. That's what the teacher said. He was speaking to some religious people who were wanting to kill him because he was, he was telling them that he was the Son of God. It was a fairly lengthy discussion, but he was making it clear to them that all he said and did were in complete harmony with his Father in heaven. Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but he has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honour the Son, just as they honour the Father. Whoever does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, he continued, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. Well, when it comes to matters of life and death and of life beyond this life, there can be no greater authority than Jesus, the Son of God. It is he who embodies life and who was the very 
manifestation of life among mankind. To know him is to have life in all its fullness. He would go on to say sometime later, shortly before raising his friend Lazarus from the dead, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? You know, it would be very easy in the presence of so many ancient burial sites, long forgotten tombs, countless graveyards and memorials, it would be very easy to think that the dead stay dead and that that's that. But it isn't. It isn't that. On one occasion, some different religious people came to Jesus and were essentially making fun of the idea of a resurrection from the dead. They asked Jesus a question, trying to catch him out, but of course they couldn't. And after correcting their faulty logic, Jesus addressed the matter of resurrection. He said, but that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now, he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. When God spoke to Moses from the burning bush, he did not say, I was the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He didn't say that. What he said was, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And he said that not only because God always is, but because he is the God of the living. And so Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all live. When Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus alongside Peter, James, and John upon the, the holy mountain, they hadn't been resurrected from the dead, as it were, for they were all alive. And if Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and Elijah all live, then so too does Peter, James, and John, and every man and his mother, and Uncle Tom Cobley, and all. When my, when my dearest June had to leave this life, I was devastated. You, you, you understand that, don't you? Yeah. I, I, I've, I've, never, I've never got over it. But I do know that that wasn't it. I, I do know that though she is no longer here with me physically, she hasn't ceased to be. As Jesus said of the daughter of Jairus, the leader of a synagogue, she is not dead but sleeping. And in like manner, as David said of his child that Uriah's wife bore to him, I shall go to her but she will not return to me. And this is why we live with, with hope. Even in the presence of so many ancient burial sites, long forgotten tombs, countless graveyards and memorials, this is why we live in hope, because God is not God of the dead, but of the living. And we live in hope because Jesus 
Well, he has overcome death. So that in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That was our living brother Paul writing to believers in Rome. Earlier he wrote, but we do not want you to be uninformed, uh, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. No, we shall not grieve, we shall not mourn as others mourn, as those who have no hope. Instead, let us show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. And know this, in spite of all the ancient burial sites, long forgotten tombs, countless graveyards and memorials, know this, the best is always yet to come.